Okay, Emma, you have uh, remote oh. access, but can you just explain this document before I switch to the? Oh, right. So, um, so we've got our shared document here. So please, can you um, uh, put your name in the participants list? Um, and also, as Malvik said, please um, uh, add an icebreaker. And our question is, and really our thought today are capturing what you think about project design. So please put an icebreaker image or gif in there. I put uh, one about how I feel about project design, which is always Yoda based for me because I love Yoda. Um, and I always think I'm learning something new. Yeah. Um, and you can also um, access all our slides as well. So on Zenodo now. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, welcome to our oh, welcome to our session on designing the Turing Way Guide to Project Design, which today is being led by myself, Emma Batul, and Malvika from the Turing Way community. Um, and I'm just going to first of all just introduce what the Turing Way is. I know some of you will be familiar, so it's just going to be a really quick quiz through. There we go. So um, the Turing Way is an open source project that involves and supports its diverse community to make data science reproducible, ethical, collaborative and inclusive for you. We have a very strong community ethos and we want you to be involved in our project by making contributions in whatever way um, you can to our expanding resources that we are curating for your use. So the Turing Way is not just one thing. Um, it is a book, which is probably how you might know it, but it's also, as I just said, a community and a very diverse community. Um, it's an open source project and also a culture of collaboration. Um, so we very much welcome you to make contributions to our resources as we take an open and collaborative approach to everything that we do. And um, we have a code of conduct that sets out how we want um, everyone to interact in our community. And we have information about how you can contribute and how these contributions are recorded on our GitHub repository. Contributions are not just writing, but also having discussions with us, reviewing other people's work, maintaining the project repository, fixing bugs, giving talks like today. And there are many other ways to contribute to this project. So it is an open source project. So what that actually means is that everyone um, is free to read, reuse, distribute, modify, and co-develop our resources. The, the project actually belongs to the Turing Way community, and it is built on um, open source projects. So you can see some of them here, like GitHub and Jupyter. Um, so the moonshot goal and maybe the aim of the, of the book and the resources that we draw together is to provide a guide that makes reproducible research too easy not to do. So the book was initially set up as a guide for reproducibility, but this has been expanded and the book is still expanding um, to also include project design, which is what we're going to talk about today, communication, collaboration and ethical research to enable data science researchers and really all scientific researchers in general to be, um, to be open um, with what they are um, working on. The guide for reproducibility contains the majority of the content of the book at the moment, but it's still in progress and, and we are always happy for it to be added to. Um, there is a lot of new content in progress that is going to be added to the other guides. So the guide for collaboration has been added to recently with new chapters on getting started with GitHub and remote collaboration. And there's also new workings and expansions of the leadership and data science chapter that will be um, released soon. Um, the project design guide um, has minimal content at the moment, um, which is about personas and pathways, file naming and code styling. So what we're really looking to um, is to expand this content and we hope that we can discuss how we can do this with you in today's session. So I will pass over to the next person, which I hope is Malvika. Sorry. So yeah, sorry, I skipped the previous slide by mistake, but yeah, we want to talk about project design with you and mostly because we, we want to understand what kind of needs every people in research software engineering, humanities, or people who are in between have. 
um, there are a lot of topics that are contained within the project design, which start from you know thinking about the project idea, capturing the ways of working, what kind of project management tools and practices will be used, what kind of skills do we have, what expected outcome do we have, how do we measure success and so on. So I want to quickly give a discussion a snapshot from what it was like five to 10 years ago when I just did not even understand what project design is. And all I wanted to do is to code for my thesis. And the, the real problem started when I was very close to finishing my thesis and I had to publish it because now I had to think about, oh wait, there are things that I did not do. So over a period, my instinct about project design has changed. I have learned more about reproducibility, accessibility, and the, the need to use and build upon our open source work. So it has become one of the priorities for me. Um, Emma and Batul and I had been discussing this for a while now. So what we had been thinking about is to capture some of these project design regrets, mistakes, and lessons learned uh, from not knowing what project design looks like. So what I will ask is, uh, let's take five minutes and I will show you the sheet. We have, a, wow, amazing gifts. <laughs> we have a shared note area here and the reflection and five minutes silent share, uh, documenting that we would like you to do is capturing what your personal project design regrets, mistakes and lesson learns are. I will start by saying that mine is not version controlling from the start. Um, and with that, I'll just start, start the clock for myself and remind you in five minutes.
Okay, just 10 seconds if you want to wrap up. So I'm looking at a lot of familiar uh, points here. Um, I'm just, I have uh, summarized it as version control, uh, code review, code testing, uh, data type. I think it was about input and output, like not having a clear expectation. Archiving and storing plan, focusing too much on one feature and not dividing the time properly, changing platform or language styles, uh, workflows, lack of workflows, lack of communication of the vision and lack of documentation. Um, I know that a few of you are writing later. Can you, do you want to unmute yourself and share uh, a couple of examples from your work? So I saw someone writing about governance. I think one of the hardest ones. Do you want to share a little bit about it? Sure, yeah, that's that's me. So hi everyone, I'm Liz from the Sloan Foundation. So I'm coming not necessarily from a perspective that's uh, a direct experience, but what from what I've seen yeah. of projects that I um, evaluate for potential funding or you know try to yeah, learn I, from and understanding one, some pain right, points. And like, what I've noticed is that when projects might gain like um, unexpected success, like attraction from potential users and contributors, um, that governance structures break down quite quickly because it wasn't built into the, des the design from the very beginning on how to deal with new voices who might come in with assumptions of like democratic um, decision-making or you know expectations as to how their inputs will be um, processed. Um, so, yeah, that that's kind of my um, observation. Just, it, it's a great thing to have unexpected success, but but then if your governance breaks down, it might make your life much harder. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I think that also includes the the lack of definition of what roles and responsibilities different stakeholders would play in your project. If there is no clarification, there could be redundancy of the effort that's being made. Um, I think Dan was writing about community where the regret is thinking about the community from the start. I think that's that's the best practice. Is it, Dan? Um, I, I'm not sure that I really know. I, I think it's something that um, I guess that some projects that I've been involved with haven't done as well as I would like. And I'm it, so I. I don't know. I, I'm not sure that you can do it completely right at the start, but um, but at some I don't know. At, at some point, a project seems like it changes from kind of one person's idea to something that that potentially becomes more of a community project, and and I'm not exactly sure where that happens or how that happens. And I just wanted to write something about about that being a problem. Yeah, that's that. that's definitely definitely true. Um, I am going to move on from the regrets because regrets are a good place to identify where we can make the changes. Um, I don't really know where I clicked. So here are some things that we have found why project designing is important. Project design in general requires a selection of tools, a selection of practices, and also establishing processes and workflow. So for example, um, just this image is one of my most favorite illustrations we've ever created, because it really makes you think about how a project life cycle looks like. So you would have a research idea, you would like to plan and design your research, by interacting with people who are your stakeholder. And it's also a place where you identify who your collaborator and users would be. Then you collect your data, uh, process your data, which requires you to understand what platform you're gonna use for collaboration, what standards, convention, and protocols you would choose. Uh, then comes data and research objects, which are again, part of documentation. So if other people who have not been involved in these process until here can come in and understand where your project is at. Then comes communicating your workflow and results. So in between this, this and this, there's a lot of work happening. Uh, and that work comes from something that Liz was talking about, governance, roles, responsibility, which has been clearly defined. So people know exactly what to focus on, what goals are we aiming to achieve, and what duration and time point have been given for that. And then comes uh, sharing your research objects, 
but also ensuring that you're preserving them well. So you're making sure that someone else in your lab or in your community can reuse them in order to build upon your work. Um, there's a lot of decision making that's also happening here. It's not just about data, but also what kind of decision are being made and which people are making it because based on how your team looks like, you would have different sort of challenges and different sort of uh, decision biases that can be integrated. So understanding where the bias can be integrated, how can we mitigate them and so on. And this is why project design is so important because you need to be thinking about this from the beginning rather than waiting until the end or at some point in your project. So with that, I want to again, go back to our shared note and think about why, document, why we should document project design aspects. Um, and maybe you can also just drop the why documentation, but think about which aspects are important about project designing. So for example, a few, uh, few statements that we have written in the document also I'm um, sharing here is that we want to ensure sustainability and reusability of our research. We want to ensure that we have an inclusive work culture and we involve diverse stakeholders. So from your perspective, what do you think we should, in, we should include in our motivation for project design? So I'm again gonna give you five minutes. So this is very misleading, don't go outside yet. <laughs> five minutes shared. Uh, note taking and then we'll discuss that. So keep writing, but I'm going to start reading it because then we have very little time left for Batul to demonst demonstrate the repository. So some of the points that I'm looking at are, first of all, we have thought about that there's a lot of practices which we do, but they are rarely documented. And there's also chances to miss opportunities if we don't step back and look at the project from outer perspective. Enable feature in predetermined and agreed manner, um, allowing informed discussions and when a particular design has reached to it, its end. So it's also about maintenance, sustainability, and also deciding when to archive. Makes work more efficient and collaborative, encourages people to be involved in the project. So when we have clear pathways for engagement and contribution, it's quite easy to maintain it. Norms and equity. So I totally agree with that. I think unwritten norms are the most dangerous one because a lot of people who are new 
wouldn't feel empowered to participate in the project in different level if there is too much of hierarchy and uh, different concerns people have about moving project goals. Um, it's hard for a project to move from practices that were designed for one person to practice that work for a team, but it's also essential to document and use practices that work for a team for a project to be successful. So it must be considered from the start how to split the work and how it will be reviewed and what decision will be made. Yeah, recognition is super important. If we have identified roles and responsibilities and people know exactly what they are doing, they feel recognized and uh, th the transparency of credit would be uh, super useful. Promoting research reproducibility, looking at from the beginning what re research reproducibility aspect we're gonna apply, preventing potential fallout between project stakeholders because they already have an understanding of where we are collaborating. Clarity of those who want to join from a variety of different backgrounds. I think this is very important for communities where open source community projects would have different community members entering at different stages. Okay, with that, I will actually let B Batul take over. Thank you so much for engaging in these uh, discussions and shared ideas. To you, Batul. Yeah, I'm just going to share screen right now for the Hopefully it's the right one. Seize the second slide. Uh, do you see the issue right now, Malvika? Yes. Uh, can you increase the font size? Just a little bit. Okay. Uh, so we need to screen, so just a bit. Let me try this. Is that better? I think so, yeah. Okay. So this is the issue that we guys have prepared for you to have a go with it. And this is the repository of the Turing way. So if you pressed here, you'll be taken to the repository itself. And you are very welcome to explore in your own time, but it's not necessary at all to go through the issue of her. So as Malvika and Emma beautifully explained the Turing way and the guide for project design, if you did it like here, you'll be taken to the guide for project design. And this is the Turing way book. And as you can see here, we got all the six guides, and one of them is the guide for project design. Uh, we are very, very keen to expand on the guide for project design. We've got right now three chapters, but we want to expand more and more. And your contribution doesn't have to be writing a chapter. It can be just an idea or a resource that you've read somewhere and you want it to be added, to the, uh, or you think like other contributors might find it useful. So if you go back to the issue itself, what is it? Did I lose it? Sorry. Yeah, here we go. So the contribution can be anything from simple suggestion for a link or resources that you've read somewhere and you think it's going to be useful for a new contributor. Or it could be a blog post that you've written previously or a case study that you've gone through in the internet or in your own project or even in back to story inspired by your own experience. Or it could be that you've gone through the book and you've gone through this chapter and you think it needs to be editing. Uh, it could be, so any kind of these things. In, in the Turing way, we don't count commits and we are as the only way for people to contribute. We value each and every contributors. We use the all contributor specification. So, so idea does count as contributions. And if you go back to the Turing way itself, as you can see, we have right now 245 contributors. And if you go to the end, you're gonna see everyone is assigned an emoji. For example, Ada here, got this emoji, which means she contributed for ideas and planning and feedback. So going back to the issue itself, uh, it, if you write your own name, the link for the resources that you think is going to be useful 
example, describe that resources and under which chapter you think it could be added, you'll be added to the contributor table. Uh, one thing that I want to highlight that we have our next book dash uh, is in May and the application form is open. And book dash is basically um, a book sprint, but it's the most amazing book sprint. And it's the one that I think the way that I got involved with Turing Way was through the book dash. So yeah, um, please do sign up for the application form. And that's it. If, and if you've got any kind of question, please feel free to ask. And to you, Malvika, uh, stop sharing. Thank you, Batul. Uh, yeah, so half an hour is not enough to show or discuss a lot of things. Um, this is why we wanted to have this issue open so you can come back to it whenever you want. We are at the moment just finalizing or thinking about what chapters we should in include in there. And this is why this discussion is so important for us that we ensure that your ideas are integrated from the beginning. So you are the users of the things that, that we are developing together. I have also created a hack MD with like lots of links and information that you may need to get orientation of the Turing way. But we have one minute if you would like to ask us any question that could be useful for you going forward. Uh, perhaps not a question, just a comment. I'm always really impressed by the quality of the illustrations that the Turing Way has. Um, do you guys commission them? Do you have an in-house artist? That, that no, we, really we, we, I have been told that if there were no illustration, the book would be boring, <laughs> which is like, oh, great. We are investing on illustration because it makes it interesting. But you're right. I think it, it does make it a lot more understandable of concepts. And we are actually investing on these illustrations by hiring a forum called Scriberia. And these images are available under CC BY. Anybody can use anywhere they want. We are very happy for you to adapt it as well because uh, you know it can be edited. We do have some files which can be edited in Photoshop. Uh, you can ask me for it because it's really large. We haven't uploaded it anywhere, but it's on Zenodo. Thanks, Emily. Please use it in your thesis. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, Stephen, is it the end of the session now? I think we're just about drawing into the end of the session. Yes, uh, I've, been, I've been expecting uh, Rachel to pull us back, actually, <laughs> but it hasn't quite yet happened yet. Maybe she's giving us a little bit of leeway. Um, so I thought that I had a quick question, actually, if you have time. So I thought this was brilliant. I mean, I don't think enough um, thought is ever given to software design in research software projects at all, really, um, at least in my experience. So I think this kind of guidance is critical um, and it's great for raising the awareness of the importance of it, too. Um, so, I mean, I know that a lot of what you're doing here is, you know, attempts to find out what's important and what should be included. What's your feeling as to what is the things that are currently missing uh, from the from the guide? What would you like to see? I think we want to make sure that our resources are available for people who are not already a coder or data scientist. So we want to start from really talking about uh, different practices and jargons and uh, aspects that are involved. And then probably over time, we grow into going a lot more hard coding part and what kind of resources and tools are available for people. So I think the, the start should be really uh, de-jargonizing our data science, because that's what I have learned also at the collaboration workshop, because a lot of humanities researchers don't really feel they are part of all the system, or they are even allowed to learn from us because we don't talk in a way that is accessible. That would be but definitely something. I, t I totally agree with that. I think that's, that's an excellent standpoint. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thanks so much. Daniel. I, sorry, I was just going to say that um, we're not actually in a breakout, so nobody's going to be able to call on to bring us back. So we're going to have to actually just go back to them. That's a good the, point. Thank you so really. much, uh, everyone, for coming along. And as I said, all these project resources are open for you. Uh, contact us while you're in collaboration workshop and you want to get some links. Thanks again. Thanks, Stephen, for hosting. Thank you.